lot of great things have happened for offer Lorna Harleyfield. She became a mom recently and now is the owner of a publishing company. I talk one on one with her about what's next for her for this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close Ups on Facebook. Lorna Harleyfield, welcome back to the award winning Quentin's Close Ups. Hey, I'm so happy to be here with you again. It's It's been a hot minute since last time. Yes, indeed. And I know obviously a lot has changed in your life since that time, and we'll get to, to that in just a moment. But obviously, Tobacco Sun came out in 2017 when I first interviewed you for Quintus Close Ups, and yes. your newest book, The Ocean at Night, came out in October. Mm -hmm. What chapter are you on in your book, Author Life? Okay. Um, in my book, Author Life, I am at the point where everything's changing. I'm not a new author just looking for my first deal anymore. Um, I've gotten that first deal. Um, I've had a second book come out. I've been a magazine columnist since then. I was the book columnist for Skirt Magazine for quite a while. Um, I've done a lot of things, and now I've actually decided to open up a publishing label so that I can help other authors' dreams come true. So I'm kind of wearing a brand new hat. How did you make your dream come true? Grit. <laughs> and, uh, honestly, um, there's some method to it. You learn how to write the query letters. You know how to. You learn how to find the agents. You learn how to find the publishers. Yes. But then you have to grow a really thick skin and take a lot of rejection. And it's like a boxing match. You get punched. You go down. You stand up. You swing. You get punched. You go down. You stand up. You swing. Eventually, one of your punches is going to connect. And if it doesn't, then you're knocked out. And um, I was going to fight till I was knocked out and I didn't get knocked out. So um, I just kept trying. Kept trying. And I know since the back sign, I understand that you have learned a lot about publishing as you have had your own work published by indie labels and anti of anthologies. That is where do yes. you fit inside of that world of, ant of labels of obviously indie publishing and anthologies? Okay, so my first book was published by a small label called Pen Name Publishing. Mm -hmm. And so I was part of their 2017 class. Um, also, I have um, a personal essay published in the Fall Lines Journal, which is published here in South Carolina. So, um, you know, and that's a regional thing. So I have works that are published on really global and regional scales. And now I'm on the other side where I can publish people. So that's kind of how I fit into that world. What is that world globally and regionally? Okay. So you can, the publishing world's huge. There are some labels that only offer print or they only offer digital or they only offer um, you know, regional publishing. So my publishing label, uh, we use Ingram as a distributor, which is the largest book distributor in the world. So anywhere, I mean, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, you know, our books are available anywhere there. And when you have a digital book available as well as print, your reach is endless. So, um, I, I like the quote um, from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Shakespeare talks about a fairy and he says, she be but little, but she is fierce. That's kind of like my label. We be but little, but we are fierce. We have a very big reach from a very small place. Where do you want that reach to be in the next five to 10 years? Oh, everywhere. I want us to be one of those indie labels that we get talked about in magazines because we're such a cool little place in the world. And the fact that um, we actually have a gift shop and a literary center in Somerville, people can come see us. I would love for tourists to float in and be like, oh, we have to see the Yellow Bird Press. This is such a cool place. Um, and I want it to be a place that publishes five to 10 authors a year and that we just market the fire out of them and, um, and they explode. That's what I want. And obviously, obviously, you are a published author, but now, as you mentioned, you right. have your own publishing company. Yep. What is the difference between publishing as an author and okay. what's the difference between publishing as a publishing company? Okay, so when I was an author, I was trying to get published. I was reaching out to people like me and saying, hey, take a chance on me, pay to get my work published, market me, put me out there. And somebody finally said yes. 
And then I learned the industry really well and realized that I can make other people's dreams come true. I have a background in marketing. I've been an author. So now I can find those incredible stories that might not necessarily be trending um because you you'll see trends in the market you know a few years ago it was all vampire books everywhere was vampire books and recently it's world war ii every book is about world war ii but i can find a book that is just awesome and not really care if it's trending or not and scream it from the rooftops and that's what i'm about so we always say our motto is literature set free and so i like to set it free how do you set yourself free when you're actually writing um, can you repeat that how do you set how do you set yourself free when you're actually writing a book? Oh, uh, the writing itself sets me free because I feel like I have so many ideas about the world, and I always have. I, I was a little bit of a living room philosopher even as a child, and so um, when I write, I find a way to illustrate it because I can't draw. I wish I could paint. I really do. I wish that I, I have so much respect for artists because they can show so much in a picture. But I feel like that through my characters, I can show the world what I'm thinking or different ideas or different points of view. Sometimes my characters are nothing like me. They have completely different points of view than I do. And it helps me explore that. It helps me know people, which is freeing in itself. I know I'm going probably off topic, but what is your point of view of publishing and writing all together? Um, the written word is everything. It's um, literally we get our, every idea we have comes from the written word. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, look at the Bible. I mean, that's the basis yes. of a lot of our, our um, religious beliefs, anything like that. We start with this, I mean, there's so much power in words and that's how we communicate from one human being to another. Um, so my point of view is, is celebrate it. If you have a story and you write it, if you have been gifted that ability, then um, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to share it. And let me ask you this because you, I know that you began to write in the first grade and started pro as a travel and tourism blogger. I sure did. Mm -hmm. What would you write to your you know, self now, your younger self, if you could? Oh, first of all, I would tell my younger self not to be so scared to share my work. At first, I was terrified for anybody to read it. I was, I was like, what if somebody doesn't like it? Well, of course, somebody's not going to like it. And what if somebody rejects me? Of course, somebody is going to reject me. And I wish I could have just had that who cares mentality then. But you kind of have to I don't know. I always growing up, one of my, my Achilles heel was a fear of failure. I wouldn't try anything that I thought I wouldn't be the best at. And I tended to do things that I was naturally good at instead of trying things that I wasn't good at. And so um, I've learned through the process of um, reaching out to publishers and agents and magazines. And yeah, I've had a lot of things published, but not near. I could open a closet and it just dump out full of rejection letters. Um, and I've learned a lot through that, that they do not matter. They do not matter. Um, criticism matters because they, you should be able to listen to industry professionals and know what you're doing wrong. And, but take it as the advice that it is and then move on and grind. Just keep grinding. And, yeah. what, and what is the latest advice that you've gotten about publishing and writing? The latest advice that I've gotten, huh? I'm trying to think. Um, I've actually attended some webinars um, with some people who are getting published just constantly in magazines because I would love to get some more articles published um, just for my own personal goal. And so I've learned a lot about how to pitch magazines and how to guest post and how to get on these big publications like, I mean, Oprah and Marie Claire and things like that. And um, so I'm trying to kind of dip my toe into that world and you know, see if I can get in some of those larger publications. And, you know, earlier you said, hey, listen, you know, I didn't take a stab at things that I know I probably feel that. What are those things that you would probably take a stab at right now? Oh, man. Um, I think from totally separate from writing, um, I would have dug a little bit deeper into dancing. Um, I was a cheerleader. I was good at it. And I was a gymnast and I was good at it. And then I started dancing much later in life and I wanted to start dancing more um, when I was in high school, but I thought, oh, I didn't start, you know, doing like 
you know, jazz and hip hop and things that are more, you know, difficult as a child. So I thought, oh, it's too late to start. And so I literally started taking ballet when I was 27 because I got the guts to do it. And um, so, and then I started taking jazz and then I started doing, I took a little bit of hip hop and I did all these things I wish that I had done when I was younger because I could have maybe done more with it if I had started younger and wasn't such a scaredy cat. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and you talked always, obviously earlier about trends within the publishing world. What are those regional trends? Um, you know, it's, it's funny because I love Southern literature. I love it because I'm from the South. I know the personalities and there's just a certain brand of woman in the South. It's great. And it's something about the heat. It just affects us. And I swear it like sweeps, it like seeps into our bones and makes us different. I don't know what it is. Just like sweet um, tea. Oh, just like sweet tea. Yes. It's, it soaks in. Um, but then I've noticed a lot of Southern authors still focus on things that, you know, are associated with the South from hundreds of years ago. The Civil War is such a huge thing um, and things like that. And so I'm trying to encourage authors to keep our culture, but write about the now, write about what's happening now um, instead of what's happening hundreds of years ago, because that story has been written so many times. And so, because everything that's going on in the world goes on in the South, but I always say, but with a little bit of dressing on it, just like our trees have a little bit of Spanish moss hanging from them, <laughs> right? you know, and everything we eat has a little bit of mayonnaise in it. We <laughs> always add that little, that flair, but um, I've noticed that Southern literature is trending a little more modern instead of just writing Gone with the Wind 15 times. So, yeah. What's now? You see all the news stories every day uh, about me. what? What that is a loaded that is there's a lot in that question. What is now? Um, it's funny. I always think of Dickens when he says it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Um, man, are we not living in that? There's so much beauty now and so much opportunity now and so much technology and so much. So we have so many things that we can do. But then there's also a lot of discord there's age old discord that's been going on for forever that's still going on um the now is is um I, I feel like the world is at some kind of strange turning point like are we going to be okay or are we not i mean we've had pandemics we've had riots we've had political discord we've had everything that you can have thrown at us and especially this past year so i think we're kind of at this place that we're like man, are we all going to start loving each other or is this all just going to, are we going to just divide and fall? I think that's where we are right now. But I always believe in redemption. Um, it's kind of the, um, it's kind of the theme of my life is redemption. I believe everything that's ugly can be good again. So, um, but we're in some kind of crossroads and I think here in five or 10 years, we'll see what that is. And I don't know what that is. You talk about theme. Obviously you wrote Tobacco Sun back in 2019 and just recently mm -hmm. the ocean at night. What is the theme for the ocean at night? The ocean at night. Okay, so I did talk about theme with Tobacco Sun, the theme being redemption. That's probably what made you remember that. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, and the theme with ocean at night, it, it's, it's similar. I believe in redemption. All of my stories are about redemption, even though it's a completely different story. And the ocean at night um, is about self-discovery more than anything. Um, and there's this whole background. There's a kidnapping in it. It talks about human trafficking. Um, but every single character has some muted part of themselves that they're having to dig down and find. And it's a really broken road to do it. But that every single character has to turn over a new leaf to make it. And so that is um, the theme of, of Tobacco Sun is um, growth. Is being able to to change and being able to awaken to who you are. Have you how the, have you been awakened to who you are? Oh my gosh, in a million ways. Um, there have been, you know, there's something, and I don't talk about it a lot in interviews, but I've dealt with severe anxiety in the past. I mean, crippling anxiety, quit my job anxiety, um, just you know, why do I feel like this all the time for no reason, anxiety. And I think getting a hold of that and learning how to control that um, changed my life. 
It really did. It that was um, in 2012. It was the worst. I just remember it was the peak of just always just feeling on edge for absolutely no reason. Just dealing with something that a lot of people deal with and not wanting to talk about it and not wanting to look weak. And when I got a hold of that and I got past that and I dealt with that, that was a game changer for me. And so many people deal with it. So I'm okay talking about it now. I just haven't in the past because it does come with a stigma like. You know, and I had panic attacks and I had all of this crazy stuff going on. And um, there were so many things and I had a lot of support from family and was able to get through that. But, um, man, that was a game changer. Wow. And speaking of which, I know you said this quote. I think I was always an offer. I just finally figured out in my early 20s that no one was going to just discover me and give me a book deal. How did you actually discover yourself as an offer? It... Well, I realized that because I write and because I mean it, I'm an author. Um, I thought somebody had to like tell me I was an author or you had to have a book out to be an author. But I realized, no, I was born an author. It's just about everybody else finding out I'm an author. So um, and nobody's just going to like it's not getting knighted. It's not like somebody's going to touch your shoulder on both sides. Oh, you are now an author. That is not how it works. Um, when you become something, it's because you have told yourself you are that thing. It, it's your own realization that you are that thing. And so, um, yeah, I realized it. And you said this quote, I matured into doing the research and learning how to get published. What are you still researching and obviously learning today? Um, everything. Um, I mentioned before about getting in the magazine publications, the bigger publications, and it always starts with a Google search. How do I do this? And then you just go down the rabbit trail and figure out how to do it and then find people who have done it. I will reach out to people on social media. I don't care who they are, how big, how small. If they have some knowledge I need, I'll strike up a conversation. Um, and I've realized it's, I'm not intimidated by anyone because every single person puts their pants on the same way I do one leg at a time, unless they have some, something really fancy. I don't even know about, but, um, we're all the same, you know? And when people who are, you know, there's, I'm, I'm still a relatively small fish, but I'm a little bit of a bigger fish than I used to be. And when authors reach out to me and say, how do I do this? I'm happy to reach back to them because I know where they're at. So when people are a bigger fish than me, I reach to them. I'm not afraid. So it's just about, um, you just have to dig in and just start looking for what you want. And let me go back to obviously your issues, obviously with anxiety. Mm -hmm. Did you have any issues with anxiety when it came to writing your first book? Um, no, actually, no, the anxiety was almost, I was so scared of getting, I was afraid that I would never do it. That I would get stuck in a life I didn't want, doing a job I didn't want. I was afraid that I would never be that thing that I dreamed that I would be. Um, you know, it just, that was where the anxiety came from. The writing was freeing. The writing was, was a bright spot. That's good to hear. And I know you told Mary Regan that you didn't take a lot of courses in writing, but you took some. You also mm-hmm. said you, you are a college dropout. It yes, is a different sir. journey for everyone. What yeah. exactly was that journey? Okay, so with college, I went back three times to try to appease my parents, but <laughs> I dropped out every time because I just couldn't stand. I'm like, whenever I would have an assignment that I thought took me away from my writing, I would be like, who just sat in some boardroom and decided I had to do this to get a degree? What does this have to do with my life? And I realized that, you know, we're kind of, and it's okay. College is great. I hope my child goes to college, but if she doesn't, that's fine. As long as she's doing it for a really good reason. Um, Because we're kind of conditioned to be this like brick that society tells us you be this brick and then go in this wall and fit in your square, you fit right there, brick in the wall. And I feel like I was a really oddly shaped brick and that my journey was going to be different and I wanted to build my own wall. So, um, I stopped going to school. I finished my novel. Um, and I always tell people, if you're going to claim you're different and that your journey is different, you better be ready to prove it. You're not, you don't stop going to college or stop doing something like that and then go home and sit on the couch. You do it. And um, so I finished my first novel when I was 23, um, started finding agents, started sending out queries, um, started asking every blog in town if I could guest post for them. And I went to work. 
I went to work at the College of Lorna, and I worked hard. <laughs> so. And what are those courses now? <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, it's everything. It's it's learning how to be a mom and run a business and be an author. Um, it's learning how to to juggle really life and learning how to run on no sleep. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> And, and you said this too, quote, I had many influences. I had a poetry teacher at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, who I mm-hmm. cleared up with my relationship with language. Otherwise, it was more experienced than formal education. Voice is so is much more than grammar and structure. It's taken to the bones, running around bare feet on wet grass, and listening to your grandfather's living room philosophy. It's yeah. living. What's your philosophy now about writing? Oh, about, well, you write what's in your head. Whatever's talking to you, spit it out. People will see this character. They get this idea and think they have to have this whole entire structure built before they can write word one. Whatever is in your mind, you get it on paper because that is when it's going to start flowing. Um, I have started with just single bits of dialogue that I just picture these characters going back and forth. And then the story unfolds as I just listen to them. It keeps building. You can't write a book without writing. And people try to brainstorm this whole thing right. and they've never written one word. So how are you going to get to know those people? Yes. How are you going to get to know the people talking to you? Talk right. back. Right. <laughs> yes. yeah, my philosophy on writing is right. It's yes. so it's so much more simple than people make it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, and speaking of characters, Tobacco Sun is partly based on true stories of people whom you actually met. I know uh-huh. Jimmy Lynn and Sidra are very much two sides to you. Confident, sassy, and sensual. Versus always feeling second choice or late to the party dressed wrong. How yeah. confident, sassy, and sensual are you these days? I'm pretty confident and I'm pretty sassy. <laughs> it's just kind of who I am. I, it really is. And I feel good when I just... And it's weird because I ain't used to be that way necessarily. I think some of that comes with age. I mean, it was always in there. But then, you know, you go through middle school and high school and early adulthood. And you have this, like, need to kind of look at everybody around you. And I can honestly say, I don't care what anybody else is doing. I mean, if I'm going to, you know, march to my own beat, like play the beat, I'm going to march. It just feels good. It feels great just to like who you are. And I do like who I am and I'm not ashamed of that. And, um, you know, I've embraced who I am. And so, yeah, I think I'm pretty confident these days. And what are you marching to next? (laughs) <laughs> I like your little shoulder shimmy with it. Um, you know, I don't know what's next because I'm still so fresh in what is here. Um, my publishing company is only about a month old um, as far as the doors being open. The idea is a lot older. My child's five months old. Um, so right now I'm just about doing well the things that I'm doing, which is unlike me because usually I always am like, and then I want to do this and then I want to do that. But so many of my dreams have come true. And so it's about kind of riding that wave for a minute right now. And speaking of which, the Yellow Bird Press, you said this quote, I'm excited about being on this end of things. I've learned so much after my first book was published. What lessons from the first book that you have applied to your second book? I've learned how to market it. I mean, honestly, it's kind of the boring part that I've learned. I've learned how to get it out there. I've learned how to go to every signing that I can, to every event that will have me scream it from the rooftops. Um, I've learned to rub elbows with other authors and to celebrate them and, you know, scratch their back. They scratch my back. Um, I've just learned about the industry and how to, how to flourish in the industry. And it's really just by the way you flourish anywhere else. Know people, be nice to people, celebrate people, and they'll celebrate you back. Yes. And you said this too, quote, I decided to open a full service press to look for talent and not just up and up market trends. But what are those up market trends right now? That's when I was talking about um, YA is really big right now. Um, but that's when I was talking about a few years ago as vampires and it was World right. War II. Right. Yeah. Right now, um, young adults, huge. Um, the unreliable narrator, like Girl on a Train, The Woman in the Window, um, Gone Girl, we're kind of coming off that trend a little bit, but that was really huge for a minute. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of female stories, female empowerment stories, which that's a good trend. And, and that's one I'm a fan of, but I'm just saying that 
I will look at everything. And if you, if, if it's a really good story, I don't really care what's trending. I'm going to give you a shot. Coffee table books, maybe picture books. Um, we're not going to do coffee table and picture books. Um, we're going to do fiction. It's all going to be fiction. Um, and anything, you know, I'm not interested so much in sci-fi. Um, we're not like romance or erotica or anything like that. We kind of stick to, um, women's fiction, thriller, mystery. Um, I love a good coming of age story, family epics, things like that. And you said this too, the publishing label does just that. We already found some incredible offers coming to shelves this year and next, but mm -hmm. what, what offer resembles you? Not a one of them. They're not like me and I'm not like them. And that's great because that gives us a really diverse catalog. Um, we're all uh, very different writers, very different subject matters, but all we're all, we're all from the South so far. And I think I just gravitate towards that because it's what I know. Um, but as far as the subject matter and who we are as people, couldn't be as different as the primary colors. I mean, we are all just different, different, different. You said this too, quote, we do have special affection for Southern authors and Southern literature that tackles the region and new cutting edge ways while still not losing the sense of culture that makes the area so unique. What are those cutting edge ways? Um, so for instance, the author I just signed delves into the underbelly of the world of influencers. You see all these um, Instagram influencers now. So it's really now. And she is an influencer. And so she is really brave because she kind of exposes some of the ugly parts of that and the things that people have been willing to do to get more followers or to get more fame. And so, but yet she doesn't lose the sense. I mean, it takes place of, in Charleston. So she doesn't lose the sense of culture and right. where we are in the world. So I think that in itself is cutting edge. Um, and also the fact, just the, the press itself, that we have a place people can come and enjoy and be a part of what we're doing. What publishing house can you walk into and sit with them and have tea with them and work next to them in a community workspace and just soak it all in? There's nowhere I have ever heard of that does anything like that. And speaking of which, you said this quote, I don't believe in competition as there is enough to go around. But then mm -hmm. what do you actually believe in? What's your substitution for competition? Um, camaraderie. Mm. I believe in helping each other. I believe even if you're in the same business, everybody does something a little bit differently. Build each other up. You know, I've, I was never the kid growing up that if they poured me a cup of Kool-Aid and my cousin a cup of Kool-Aid, I would hold it up and make sure we had the same amount. Mm -hmm. And that's still a pet peeve of mine because that is is not life. We don't all have to get the same size slice of pie because if we are all giving, we're going to end up with the same slice of pie naturally, not because of measures or checks and balances, but because we're doing the right thing and we're helping other people. We are encouraging other people and we're not doing dishonest things behind closed doors. We're going to be fine and we're all going to get what we need. And you said this too, above all else, obviously talk about advice, be authentic, speak your true voice or one you hear from your character, know the character and don't change it to fit other people's ideas. In our, in our, in our, <laughs> in our, in our, in our authenticity to your style will bury you and make you miserable. Some publisher will see your vision. <laughs> right. I love that. What vision do you see when you, when it comes to style, obviously? Um, I just look, you can tell if an author's being authentic and that's what I look for is authenticity. Um, you can tell if somebody's just trying to parrot something someone else has said. And there's all these um, like catch phrases in the world right now. You'll see on the news and like, and a lot of times in politics too, this side says this thing and this side says this thing. And they have these like catch phrases and you have that in writing too, but they'll try to mimic other authors and they have, you can just tell they're doing it. And it's, like a knockoff brand of something somebody's already written. You can just pick up on that. So I love it when something's fresh and something I can tell it just came straight from somebody's soul mm. and it's an X factor. There's no way I can explain to you when I see that, but it's just there. It's just yeah. there. It's just and, there. 
and, and let me get back to you. Obviously, you said you told me this. You had a baby prematurely, right in the middle of all of this. Getting right. a publishing company done and whatnot. Uh-huh. And you said this quote, I had a premature baby right in the middle of it. So it was truly a labor of love. <laughs> what will be the title of that book? Um, labor of love. <laughs> <laughs> it might be blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. <laughs> that would be another one. Anything I do, I do because I'm so passionate about it that I can't do it. And, but with passion, people think it's just this constant high and thrill, like, but it's not, man. It, even motherhood. I love my child more than anything in the whole wide right. world. But there are times that I have walked out of the room and screamed into a pillow. Like, what am I going to do with this kid? Because she's just screaming and I can't make her happy or something. And Or I haven't slept and it's 4 a.m. And I haven't had one ounce of sleep. It is hard. But I'm passionate about that kid and I love her. Yes. So it doesn't matter. And that's how I feel about my writing, too. When you're passionate about something, it just the other stuff, it matters in the moment, but long term, it does not matter. You forget the hard parts. Lorna Hollyfield, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin's Full Subs. Oh, thank you so much, Quentin. I appreciate it. I always enjoy talking to you and watching your interviews. Thank you. Likewise, thank you.